Just briefly, as background, I'm a neurologist uh, at MGH in Boston. My path into um, becoming a provider in this area has to do with my, my, my uh, late mentor, Hugo Moser. I, I came from Europe to Johns Hopkins, where I had the good fortune of being mentored by Dr. Moser, who um, is the person who discovered the very long chain fatty acids and did so much groundbreaking work in the field. And he taught me really to be first and foremost aware of the patient condition and link all the research and research drive to that patient perspective. And I think that's served me very well and I feel very privileged to be in this space. Um, briefly here, my disclosures. I run various different trials also in gene therapy and also founder of a gene therapy company. So I'm uh, gonna do a little bit of uh, biology here because I think this is actually the first ALD session where we're maybe uh, here might have some new faces uh, who are new to the field. So this is a single gene disorder caused by mutations in ABCD1. ABCD1 encodes a peroxisomal half transporter and this half transporter um, moves certain lipids, very long chain fatty acids, into this peroxisome for degradation. If this um, protein does not work, you have elevations in these lipids that can be detected as early as, as birth and um, have, have really transformed the field because of our ability to diagnose this disorder. So for this talk on women, it's important to know that this is an X-linked disorder. And for many years, we thought of this as an X-linked recessive disorder. What does that mean? Most of you know. So the gene sits on the X chromosome. So women have two copies of uh, the X. Men only have one. So it, it has long been thought um, that is the reason why men are more affected and women are only um, carrier, so to speak. But I think the dilemma is really that we use these terms recessive and dominant. And uh, recessive meaning that the mutation is weak and can be overcome by the second X. And dominant means that it's so strong that it actually, uh, the mutation now emerges despite a second healthy copy of the X being here. Okay, And these terms recessive and dominant are starting to go out of fashion because we're realizing that it really is not so that you're either recessive or you're dominant or you're unaffected or you're affected, that there's really a spectrum over the course of life. Okay, So this is, I hope, not too complicated and just seeing this overview and thinking about having these two copies um, and whether you think of this gene defect as being weak or strong is how we think of whether you use the term carrier or you use the uh, um, or, or you decide not to and we've really moved away from that so um, Boys and men, we know that over the course of a lifetime, there are various different man manifestations, whether you have childhood cerebral ALD or you go on into adulthood and you have AMN, and it's very hard to predict um, uh, which course you will take. But we also understand that in women, there are different phases, and uh, Taylor already nicely outlined some of this um, tension around um, whether you call yourself asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. And then as you go into adulthood, we now know that the majority of women do have both signs and symptoms. And the majority of this talk will be about what are those different symptoms. And I will argue that despite us now recognizing that most women um, have symptoms across the lifetime, there's a lot of heterogeneity and not one size fits all, okay? Um, so a first study coming out from the group in Amsterdam and Mark Englund's group showed that the occurrence of symptoms um, really correlated with age. So the older you were, the higher your likelihood 
of uh, developing symptoms. And as Taylor said, across the lifetime, chances are that about 90% of women develop some symptoms, and that increases with age. But there is important heterogeneity here. As I said, one size does not fit all. You can't say, well, that woman had these symptoms, so I will also have it. One has to very much pay attention to your individual course, your signs, your symptoms. Many women remain asymptomatic for very long periods of time. The pathology, um, when it occurs, can differ quite a bit. It can be limited to the spinal cord only. We call that myelopathy. It can be limited to the peripheral nerve, and there are different parts of the peripheral nerve. It can be the large fibers of, um, that Im are impacting your sense of, of, of balance or how much weakness or sen sensory changes you ha have. Small fiber neuropathies are often associated with pain. There can be also some uh, con contribution of circulation of um, what we call vascular insufficiency. So sometimes you'll notice this if there's swelling in your in your feet, if there's discoloration. Um, and then more recently, we've described we've been discovered that there can also be movement disorders in a subset of women. And very rarely, um, I'd say only one percent of of women I've seen can develop some brain um, demyelination and adrenal gland pathology. But this is only the case in women who have um, their second X um, skewed or skewing occurring to the uh, X that is defective. And I'll show you how to uh, screen for that. I don't want that to cause worries here. So the spinal cord dysfunction, what does that look like? So there are two main tracts in the spinal cord. One sits in the back of the spinal cord that brings sensory information up from the muscles, up into the brain, tells you where your joints, where your limbs are located. So if you have balance problems, that's because of this tract in the back of the spinal cord. And then there's another spinal cord tract that, uh, that moves down from the brain, so it go goes in the other direction. My mentor, Hugo Mosa, used to use his big arms to show this dilemma with the long tracts because we were all very frustrated with how can we fix these long, long roads in the nervous system, right? And this uh, tract really brings the signal down, uh, the motor signals down to the muscles. So that's the reason why you have tightness in your limbs. You have a weakness and you can't move uh, uh, so well. So beyond this, we've more recently found that there can be, in a subset of women, uh, movement disorders that are not occurring um, uh, due to um, MRI changes on, on brain or demyelination. And this has been very interesting to us. We know that uh, balance problems can occur because of the spinal cord dysfunction. So that's not been very surprising. This happens in men as well. But what we found is that some women have uh, tremor, some women can have uh, certain uh, head and neck abnormalities where they tilt their head. Sometimes this occurs early in life and then it gets better. Um, um, and then there can be something called head titubation where there's shaking of the head. And sometimes this coincides with some speech abnormalities. So um, particularly the, the, the head and neck tilts are things that we think are pretty specific to women. And, uh, and don't occur in men. So I think the landscape of ALD has really changed as we've now recognizing that women can become symptomatic. Different from men, this occurs about 10, 20 years later. Okay, so I, um, important to remember that the spinal cord problem um, is later in onset and, uh, and, and milder. But um, beyond the spinal cord, only 1% of women can develop brain demyelination, and we think this is due to skewing towards the defective X chromosome. So what are women with ALD experiencing? So I'd say balance difficulties, walking difficulties are a huge part of this, and um, often this leads to a risk of falling, fractures, injuries occurring. Neurological symptoms can contribute to poor sleep, um, poor sleep uh, in increases depression, anxiety, um, often restless leg syndrome contributes also to um, poor sleep. So understanding how there are often vicious 
uh, cycles in this whole process and how to recognize the different components and manage them separately is key. So I often get the question, I'm a woman with ALD, what testing should I have done? And I, I'd say as a baseline assessment, all women should have the following done. Um, a plasma very long chain fatty acids should be tested. ABCD1 mutation testing should be done because that is what establishes your diagnosis. And often that the mutation might already be known in the family and you just need to you know, get that report of the other family member and then target that specific mutation. Beyond that, I will get at least once an ACTH level. Um, and that is because I have seen few patients, women with ALD who develop um, adrenal insufficiency. Brain MRI also, just a first screening, just to make sure you're not missing anything. But in, as I said, 99% of women have normal MRIs, okay? Nerve conduction studies I usually get if there are some neuropathy symptoms, but not otherwise. Okay? So I, I want to sort of, you know, hearing Taylor speak over the years and, and hearing how she's maturing over the years uh, is, is, and, and coming to this very sophisticated understanding of, of the condition is, is great to see. I think I'm probably more optimistic today, and it's not just because I, f I see treatments emerging and, and us having new tools and resources to manage, but I think it's, it's largely because of people like Taylor and all of you. I think the community has, has become so strong, and it's really a, a reason for, for much hope. Um, I, I think learning together, we understand now how to monitor women better, we understand that there are some symptomatic treatments using agents for spasticity, for pain, um, understanding that there's some things that might help for bowel and bladder. This might all be a little different from patient to patient, but that there are opportunities to, uh, to try and see what's a good fit and do that carefully with a provider who knows about the condition. Maintaining mobility and exercise is key. So if you don't move, and if you're not using your nervous system, those, those wires, they don't really want to remain healthy. So I think that's a huge part. Psychosocial well-being. I, I, I think one has to really pay attention to one's own mental health, maintain good sleep, support each other, find positive things to, to embrace and, and cherish that there is support in a community. You know. Understanding risk-benefit to each approach is critical. I say this because you shouldn't engage with treatments that might do more harm compared to what they could accomplish in terms of uh, benefit. Leg discomfort in women has many different causes. It's not just one thing, and I think that's often misunderstood. Well, you know, there is this one treatment that w um, we're undertaking. Is it going to address all the different uh, sources of leg discomfort? No, it won't. You have to really go to your provider and understand where it's coming from. Is it the peripheral nerve? Is it the circulation in the legs? Is it spasticity, tightness? Is there restless leg syndrome? All of those things are contributing. In our clinic, we found that m women uh, with ALD take many medications with varying success, but it also shows you what needs uh, exist. So a high percentage take pain medications. Uh, um, next on the list is depression, anxiety medications, antispasmodics, bladder meds, sleep meds. Um, so th this it shows you in part where the symptoms lie and that there is some benefit to medications, but they have to be used judiciously and in the right uh, order, and you have to avoid polypharmacy, meaning too many me medications because that can backfire. Other management strategies used by women with ALD, this is a cohort of 79 uh, women we've uh, seen over the years. Um, many of them require surgical interventions for complications related to ALD after uh, fractures, uh, many had steroid injections for pain, underwent Botox injections, many have walking aid for ambulation. We are still in the course of looking at all of this data and understanding over time what is most effective. What can we extract from this experience to share, to say when should you really um, you know, start thinking about walking aid, 
Botox injections for spasticity. All of those things are still happening individually, clinically, uh, with, with the provider, but I think there is something to be said for collective experience. Small fiber neuropathy, so lots of women develop swelling in their feet, discoloration, pain. If you look at the smallest fibers in the skin, there's often a dropout of those smallest fibers, uh, indicating here the vulnerability of this part of the nervous system. And a, a study um, out of N uh, Norway showed that many women um, uh, in that uh, cohort were suffering from a small fiber neuropathy. Just briefly, restless leg syndrome, what does that mean? You have to fulfill four different criteria. You have to an, un an uncontrollable urge to move your legs, an uncomfortable sensation in the legs, crawling, creeping, aching, feeling. Usually it occurs in the evening when sitting or lying down. It doesn't have to be uh, at night alone and moving eases the unpleasant feeling temporarily. And um, just to briefly show you, um, I don't know if this is working, probably not, but the, the restless leg syndrome is exactly what I just described earlier. And we described the first cohort of uh, 32 um, patients, and we found that females were more commonly affected than males, about uh, twice as high. Um, and this was substantially higher than the general adult population. It was a small cohort. We need to gather more data over time. But it does suggest that in ALD, this is aggravated. And we have a first uh, trial that we're undertaking with the uh, University of Amsterdam, where we are in a uh, two-phase study, where we're first assessing through surveys what is contributing to leg discomfort. And then if there is a contribution of restless uh, leg syndrome, you're randomized to an agent called primipexol versus placebo, and then you go through a washout period, and then there's crossover. And we assess gait and balance um, on these uh, treatments to see what contribution might occur from improved sleep after these agents. So just to highlight in closing that there are multiple different pathologies contributing here, everything from the spinal cord to peripheral nerve, to small fiber neuropathy, but also probably cortical networks in the brain that are um, contributing to movement disorders. So in closing, I hope I've shown you that um, there's complexity here, but there's also real un uh, understanding emerging that is um, telling us what this X is doing, uh, this uh, uh, X-linked defect is doing in women with ALD. And I think, returning back to this beginning, just to highlight that um, we've examined a few patients where we've been looking at particularly the skewing and the skewed inactivation. And this might be a little sciencey, but I think it's, uh, it's actually uh, my, my biggest reason for hope. Um, and I think there's some real good biology that's going to emerge here uh, in the coming years. So bear with me. This is just one slide I'll take you through in detail. There are three patients here with three different codes, okay? And um, the, we, we look at something called X inactivation, meaning is, the, um, is uh, usually when a, a, a woman is born, the one X is inactivated. Now, if the um, inactivation is incomplete, it would be a lower percent, like 54%. And if it's fully complete, it's 100%, as you see here. So these two women had complete X inactivation, but in one woman, 42351, um, it was towards the healthy X, and so the very long chain fatty acids were very low. In the other woman, it was towards the um, unhealthy X, and the plasma very long chain fatty acids were very high, okay? And so this was a perfect scenario for us to start thinking about what happens when you get skewing either to the healthy X or to the unhealthy X. Um, and this has now led us to pursue new strategies to reactivate the healthy X. And we're working here with one of the world experts in uh, X inactivation at Harvard. Her name is Jenny Lee. And uh, this is uh, really a, a new form of gene therapy that allows you to use the endogenous own protein of the body. You're not putting a new gene in or a new protein in, you're simply trying to reactivate 
that dormant healthy X that uh, exists. So I know this sounds a little bit like science fiction, and it's a little too much science here, but I just want to pass it on because I think it's so exciting and should be something that you take away here uh, as a sign of hope and what research and progress could bring for you. So just to summarize, we recognize now symptoms in women uh, uh, more than before. Heterogeneity in presentation remains to be understood. Symptomatic treatments are available, but need to be tailored, so you have to work very closely uh, with your neurologist to understand where those symptoms come from. And then targeted treatments for women with ALD are in development. There's much to look forward to. In terms of acknowledgments, I just thought I'd put this slide in on the externally led patient-focused drug development meeting, which I think was one of the most exciting moments for me in the last year. And all the women that contributed here and brought their voice to the FDA to highlight the importance of symptoms in women and to encourage FDA to uh, allow for new drugs and new treatments to be developed. And I think what we're gonna see in the next decade is a, is a, a whole list of new opportunities that will make lives better for women.